Thanks. All right, next up we have Kevin Myers from Paul Timmer's Research Station in Tallahassee, and he's going to be given the management uh, side of the equation. Fantastic. Uh, can you hear me okay with the, uh, with the microphone? Yes. Great. If, uh, if you end up having any issues, Greg, just you know, give me the, the holler if this sound system is working. So we spent the morning uh, discussing some of the science behind uh, you know, duck management and, and tree mortality, and now we're going to all talk about management. You know, I could sit up here and give you a lecture, and, and I'm, I'm not opposed to doing that, but it would be a lot more fun if we, if we share some opportunities, or take the opportunity to share some of our own management experiences. A lot of, a lot of years of burning in, in the room right here, and, um, and we all have something to contribute to this conversation about how do we manage uh, this, this region-wide duff scourge. Um, what I think I'd like to talk about, uh, or at least help focus that discussion, and again, it's informal. You guys chime in, have, you know, raise your hand, or, or just ask questions, and, uh, and feel free to, to you know, give your own experiences as you hear me talk. Um, as I tell everybody, you know, as a manager, I spent, I burned a lot of acres in the southeast. Um, most of my management, fire management experience was at Eglin Air Force Base, a half a million acres of long and kind. Um, you know, we had uh, the program at its height, 100 to 110,000 acres of prescribed fire a year, and a variety of contexts. People like Sasha come down and, and burn with us. You know, and, and so Eglin's a, a, an interesting case, uh, case study for these kinds of issues, particularly since before that program grew, we didn't have a lot of fire for the previous 50 years. But Eglin is a unique place, and, and it's not every place. And I think that Morgan did a good job of highlighting the fact that, that the science is also conducted at a place, and so you need to try these recommendations on for your site and see what works for you. And, uh, and I want to hear about that, you know, where my rules of thumb don't apply to a particular site and where your rules of thumb, you know, that have been developed over years of experience, you know, work, and I want to understand why. So that's, that's what my goal is today. Both here in the talk, and then when we kick around in the in the, the field duff as well. So, at its core, this is the management conundrum. You know, we need to manage to reduce this duff, right? I mean, the whole purpose is to restore the site, and duff is a two to five inch impediment to doing that. If you don't <coughs> reduce the duff through consumption, this low consumption when you reintroduce that fire. You're still stuck with duff, and so you still have that problem for some period of time. But you know you, you retain your old trees, and yet you may you potentially have the uh, the problem for reburn if you've scorched a few needles but didn't consume the duff. There's little pockets here, um, but if you have high duff consumption, the other side of this uh, this catch twenty two is is unbelievable. You know overstory mortality. And we'll talk about some of the, the downstream effects of overstory mortality. It's not just that you lost some old trees, you made it, you know, made a mess for yourself in fire management for that stand, you know, for years to come. But the smoke hazards that come from long duration smol smoldering, and um, and of course some of the the compromising of the conservation objectives that you had with the stand. So so we're stuck between a rock and a hard place with this duff conundrum as managers. So. My approach today is to go through about four big bullet points uh, regarding management of duff. The first is, is really understanding time since fire and how it, how it leads to a duff problem and being able to, to, to fully map that at, at, at a scale that's relevant to you. The second is consequences of overstory mortality. We spent a lot of time talking about why trees die, but what are the, what are the consequences for your management objectives of having uh, overstory mortality? And then finally, uh, we'll identify prescription windows, we'll talk about your experiences and what windows you're using, and then we'll discuss time. And time is a really, really important concept to all management, but particularly when we're dealing with the long unburned stands. So this is, a, this is a, a picture that Morgan showed earlier, but I think it's really good to reframe you know, this, this problem by looking at duff. It doesn't take much duff to have major management consequences. As little as two inches of duff in a stand, you know, at the base of the tree can lead to mortality. This is not, uh, there is 12 tons per acre per inch of biomass in duff. You think about that, your normal fuel loads in a well-maintained long weight pine stand, uh, you know, three tons per acre, 12 tons per acre per inch. 
Think about the, the smoke management consequences <coughs> of consuming all of that at one time. You think about the heat release rates that Morgan showed, how, how deep that goes. Ecosystem consequences of consuming this are, are vast, and the practical consequences to use managers are also significant uh, in, in the event that you do cons consume it. And as little as two inches of duff is a huge problem for all of us if, it, if it's your burner. So let's not, let's not be lulled into the false sense of security that, uh, that just a little bit of duff is, uh, is not going to lead to problems. So we all know about fire in the southeast. When you burn it, you know, it reads, the grasses re-sprout, orbs come back, biodiversity is sustained. Three months later, we've got our fuel bed back. A year later, we've got you know, a, a wonderful fire-maintained stand. About three years after that, those shrubs in advanced regeneration state start to, to pop up. Ten years later, they may take over. And 30 years later, you've got you know, a, a tight change in your stand. When does the duff form? In your experience, I mean, this, this, is, this is a very important question. When does duff form in this time since burn uh, you know, disruption? I mean, as we start taking fire out of the system, is it, is it in, by year 10? Show so my hands. Who's got duff in 10 years? In 10 years? 10 years of the time since fire. Who has duff? Okay. If you don't, yeah. All right. Who's got duff with 20 years? And now, now, here we are. Show of hands. Come on. All right. So we got one. Greg says he's got duff in 10. Everybody else, you know, I see a lot of heads nodding. Show of hands. Who's got duff after 20 years? Who's got duff after 30 years? Yeah, everybody, right. everybody's going to have duff after 30 or 40 years, right? When do the fine roots grow into the duff? Is it 10 years? 20 years? What if you have duff that's in the process of being formed, but it doesn't have fine roots? Is that as big a problem as, uh, as having, well, you know, you know, a, a well-decomposed duff layer that's, that's been there for 30 and, and 40 and it's got fine roots? Somewhere... In between here and here, really dramatic ecosystem changes occur in the forest floor. And I don't know where they are. I mean, my experience at Eglin, again, a, a drier site, is that that change happens more slowly and that, that we can recover from those, uh, those fire, you know, fire-free periods, the longer fire-free periods, much faster than if you're on a flatwood site. And Eglin, even though we had you know, mostly high dry xeric Lakeland sands you know, in the sand hills, we also had about 20,000 acres of flatwoods we had managed. And, you know, those productive sites, you're going to be on this end of the spectrum when, when duff forms, but also when roots colonize that. Because I think, as Morgan was saying, it's really tied to how dry the site is. And it's got to be a good place for a root to want to invest. And, uh, and the drier the site, the longer that duff has to accumulate before a root wants to, uh, to really colonize it. And so as you're thinking about fire and breaking this, this time since burn cycle and you're managing the landscape, <coughs> once you're here, waiting another year doesn't cost you much, does it? 31 years since fire isn't a whole lot of extra degradation than 30 or 29. You know, 45 years since fire, if it's already been 44, meh. You don't have, <laughs> you don't have to rush once you're way up here. But somewhere in here, you gotta act, right? You've got an opportunity to reduce fuels and prevent duff accumulation. So as we're, as we're thinking about the management implications, let's think about this fire-free interval cycle and how it applies to your sites. And because of that, I'm, I'm a, I'm a data-driven manager. It, it, it drove my firefighters at Eggman nuts sometimes. But I, I was adamant about creating a, 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 you know, a map of every acre and when it burned. And we used all satellite data we could find, all paper records, and we had a massive effort to understand our fire history because when I was hired by James Furman, my, my, I had two jobs, figure out how to burn more and quit killing old trees. And, uh, and we brought Morgan in on that grant uh, from the Joint Fire Science Program in large part to, to address number two. So we wanted to stop killing more trees. And, and if we wanted to burn more, we had to know where we had fire and where we were already burning. And, and it seems this was, you know, just so simple, a good GIS data layer. We don't have this for the state of Florida. We don't have this for the southeast. We barely have it for a lot of our, our well-managed landscapes. And having great GIS data on where we burn and how many times it is gives you a lot of insight as to what the potential forest floor might be. So let's look at this part of Eglin over here. 
Um, this is a top secret area that nobody knows about until <coughs> um, now. Uh, they, they took fire out of in 1965. So you go on, what, what's, I can't do math in my head, 55, 60 years without fire? Oh, it's going to burn someday, but it's just chock full of duff. If you go out in there, that duff's all got fine roots. But if I'm going to prioritize where I'm going to put my limited fire resources, I ain't going to go, you know, spend my time putting that fire in there. But now, if you you start looking up here, this area has had one, two fires in the last 30 years. You know, it may have been 10 years since I last burned. This might become a priority for restoration because we have an opportunity to prevent it from getting into that that long, long unburned state. And so, as I'm as I think about this problem, I really I want to highlight the need to have highly accurate information about what burns where on your landscape. And these are, this is of course, it's a half a million acres, but the smaller your property, the more important it is to have a really good, under, you know, have a good understanding of what burned the last time you applied fire as well. I just will briefly mention that, that we're trying to do this statewide. As we've acquired more and more conservation lands, we acquire them in a state of ecological condition that's, that is more and more degraded, right? We fought up and we managed the best of the best. Now the stuff that we're handed, either as state managers, federal managers, or even private landowners, is more likely to be degraded. And so we're finding ourselves trying to reintroduce fire to a variety of sites across the state, across the southeast. And yet we don't have that basic information sometimes of how long has it been since it, it was burned and, and how well did it burn when it did the last time. And so we're in the process of working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. There's a joint fire science program uh, grant that is funded to do this in Georgia and other southern states. And we're all working together to try to map fires. It's such a critical piece of information for managers to have, not just on your <coughs> property, but statewide, so that you understand the risks of losing a fire to your neighbor's land, or a risk if a wildfire occurs, um, or you know, if you're trying to, to reintroduce fire. So this is a, this is a critical data set that we'll be uh, producing statewide for managers, uh, and then some of these other efforts will extend it region-wide at a little bit coarser scale. But for me, it's all about that knowledge, basic information, time since burn, and numbers of fires over the last. Can you go back years. just a second? I was getting that. There we go. Oh, Oops. there. Just for a second. Quick preview of what's to come. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we we talked a lot about mortality this morning. And this is what we tend to think of. I, I mean, I, I can't tell you. In fact, I have a, a collage of these slides from all the places that Morgan and I used to get calls from. Oh, I'm, my trees are dying. How, how do I stop it? Well, you, you stopped it by not burning when you did. You know, and there's no way to, to stop. This is an old growth stand at Eglin Air Force Base. This actually was a, a wildfire, but it occurred in a, in a time of year that, that absolutely consumed all the duff. We had written the stand off. Um, it was nothing but a, a turkey egg re-sprouted area, but um, unbelievable mortality in that. Here's a prescribed fire, same stand just further over outside the wildfire scar. Uh, this is Moody Forest. This is a site in Otago County, Alabama. It is unbelievable how often we burn up duff and then are surprised at the consequences. And this overstory mortality is, is really important to understand. I mean, we're trying to manage this for red cockade woodpecker. We just killed every single red cockaded woodpecker cavity tree or potential cavity tree in about 400 acres of that wildfire. Here, we, you know, this one like for folks in the room, <laughs> this was a prescribed fire. We were trying to manage that mid story. This was in 1998, 99, actually, was the prescribed fire. And we tried to, to focus on stand structure. We were reintroducing a growing season fire. First fire this thing had seen because we wanted to kill turkey oaks for red cockhead woodpecker. Well, uh, about 20 cavity trees later, you know, we had actually set back our restoration and red cockhead woodpecker recovery goals, right? And so, usually, usually, like Morgan will call me when I'm giving a talk. Uh, I feel the, the phone buzzing in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> But the uh, you know if you're if you're thinking about conservation objectives, killing old trees is almost never a good idea, and uh, and yet you know the, the the consequences go way beyond that, right? If you're trying to reintroduce fire to the stand the next time, and you got I-10 over here, 
what are those snags going to do? I mean, you got you know suddenly got tons and tons of tens of tens of tons per acre of horse woody to read this. You got to meter out that. You got residual smoke issues. And so let's really focus in on the idea that overstory mortality has long-term management consequences. I, I too often hear, who, who, raise your hand, you got to break a, a, a few eggs and make an omelet. Who, who hears it? Who said it? All right, I did say it once upon a time. <laughs> no, I, I, I really have come to, to conclude, for me, that, that that's not acceptable. And the more, the more overstory mortality we, we pretend it is, the more, the more of a bind we put our managers in. As we're burning in more and more complex contexts, we've got to get these duff reintroduction burns right, or else we're going to create you know, accidents on the highway, smoke ins, we're going to have escapes, we're going to have all the negative things that come with prescribed fire. And again, as managers, we're being called to burn more and more of this kind of stuff in more and more complicated landscapes. And so really want to nail this down, that, that when you kill trees, it's conservation uh, you know, consequences, those course, that course we need to breed is more likely to cause spot fires and, uh, and smoke hazards later. And then that residual duff uh, can be, you know, just by killing a few and they start sloughing their branches, you've created more vectors in your stand and more likely to, to reignite the duff the next time you burn it. And so the more mortality you get in a stand, the more issues you're causing yourself for decades afterwards. And this is not simply a coastal plain issue. Uh, we spent a little bit of time in the Southern Appalachians. This is the Cahutta wilderness. Um, and I just want to throw these in here because we think of duff as being, you know, sort of a natural part of the Southern Appalachians, right? Well, I actually kind of think it's probably a novel component of, the, of many stands in the Southern Appalachians. And when you look at this fire, this is the Rough Ridge fire. All of the Rough Ridge fire was classified as low severity, over 25,000 acres. This is Chattahoochee National Forest near Blue Ridge and, uh, and LJ. All was low severity. You walk out in there, one year later, there are patches of high severity everywhere, all duff driven, largely in stands of pine, whether it's Virginia and shortleaf, uh, but here's a white pine that, uh, that's totally dead. Um, and I think that's about nine inches of duff consumption around that white pine. <clears throat> and so when we think about duff and duff management, just because this is a wildfire doesn't mean that, that it's not a, a, you know, a huge probability that prescribed fires in the same kind of habitat, montane longleaf included, aren't going to have you know, significant impacts of duck consumption. And, and we just don't think about it outside the coastal plain as much. But uh, if you're managing some of those stands up in the southern Appalachians, to me this is an absolutely critical cycle to understand. <coughs> now, is this stand completely <coughs> No. I mean, these are young seedlings one year later from Virginia pine and shortleaf that have re-sprouted in that, that high severity patch. And uh, so it'll be a pine stand again someday. So let's talk about some of the other kind of habitats that we might find ourselves uh, you know, burning in or they're embedded in our uplands. Because duff management is not just a long lake pine overstory old growth problem, right? This is a terrible picture I took from a helicopter in 2007 uh, of parts of, parts of the Oki Fenoki. This looks like the blowdown of the boundary waters. So we've got organic soil, mostly duff on this end of the, prop, uh, of the property but it was about two feet thick. So the duff plus soil burned out with six inch flame lights. And a week later, all of the trees fell over jack straw. Now, if your job is to manage this with fire continuously, what's gonna happen to that? I mean, that's a lot of biomass that you gotta burn around next. And so, you know, we've seen this in the Mallory Swamp area. This is not just an Oki Finoki unique phenomenon. We've seen this in uh, parts of uh, Eglin uh, in the East Bay Swamp area. Burning swamps is, is absolutely a duff problem and one that, that you can come with some dramatic uh, impacts. Anybody else manage stuff like this where you've got truly deep, deep duff on really productive wetland sites? I mean, you know, some, yeah, some, some of the wetland features that you're asked to burn around now, you know, this is a 12, ton, 12 tons per acre per inch. 24 inches, <laughs> you start doing the math, and, uh, and that's some significant carbon being volatilized. Um, we were talking earlier about flatwood salamanders. Um, here happens to be a picture of an oh, isolated wetland in a, uh, you know, in the wildfire context. But many times, our objectives are to reduce the duff in those in those ponds so that we can get a grassy herbaceous understory again. 
Well, the conditions under which that happens are often antithetical to burning in the ovens, right? And so we've got to get creative to, you know, as managers as to how we can get this, which may be the desired future condition, without getting that in our uplands, right? At Eglin, we work with, um, with our, our biologists to try to separate out um, you know, the, uh, the uplands from the wetlands seasonally. So we might come in and do a fuel reduction burn in the uplands, and then come right back in three months later uh, when the duff was dried out in these wetlands, maybe May, June time frame, and torch off just the wetlands. And uh, you've never seen so you know, happy biologists, just, you know, I'll sit back at the engine, you know, just watching them run through the woods with drip torches, they couldn't do any harm. But we're actually doing some good. We're getting, you know, growing season fire in the wetland, but we're protecting ourselves in the upland. And for me, you know, I had to have that. I could not burn <coughs> next to Florosa or Fort Walton Beach in the summer with a land breeze at night and smoldering fuels. And so I could reduce a thousand acres of fuel on the upland sides, and then we'd just go pot, you know, jackpot fuels around the, the four or five wetlands that we met. And so getting creative like that as managers, I think is important because sometimes our objectives are to consume enough, but you got to get smart about it because if you're burning under conditions that that's going to consume, those you know six or eight inches of duff, can, you can produce smoke that goes a long way and also create reburn concerns, as well as a uh, you know manage uplands that are that are problematic. So, any questions about you know some of the the, the background ecosystem objectives, dangers of mortality before we jump into development prescriptions? I mean, I can talk, guys. I, you know, I, Morgan knows. I don't mind. I, I pour vacuums. So I'll fill it with words. But uh, moving into the idea, though, that, that, that we can develop safe prescriptions, we have to, by law, because we're burning under permits, uh, that requires to have a burn plan and prescriptions. Let's talk about what we use. Who here uses KBDI as part of their dove prescription? A lot, a lot of folks, right? KBDI, it's in the prescribed fire guide, it has been for the last four iterations, that a threshold for burning guff is 400 or below. Who uses 400 or, or below as, as part of your prescription? What do you guys use? 200? Us? Yeah. Well, in some areas, as high as 600. But burning on top of duff? Uh, yeah. Okay. Just depending on the situation. So the, the it depends is the right answer. KBDI is a funny thing. We, we tend to lean on it so much, but you know, it's a scale of 0 to 1, eight, or 1 to 800. Fully saturated soil, considered 8 inches of rain, essentially, I'm going to simplify it, is, is, eight, is, is 0. So if you got 8 inches of rain yesterday, you're, you're KBDI 0. If you have had no rain for about 4 months, <laughs> you know, you're going to be at 800. And, you know, it's, there's some seasonal tweaks and, and such as that, but as you, as you add an inch of rain, you tend to move 100 points. And so if you think of this threshold of 400 as being important, if I was at 800 coming out of this last drought and I got four inches of rain, I'm gonna be at 400. But if I was at zero and it hadn't rained in a month and a half, I'm gonna be at 400. You know, those two things are very different. And so when you're thinking about duck prescriptions and KBDI, this is a really common prescription parameter. Be really cognizant of which direction you're going. Personally, I would burn from 800 down to 400. I, after four inches of rain, I'd rather burn over the top of duff and be at KBDI 400 than I would at, you know, going up the scale. And that's, that's not sad, do it. But you know, just be, be cognizant of the direction of the drought uh, indices are pointing and combine that with time since last rain, and I'll show you here in just a bit. So for us at Eglin and part of Morgan's uh, dissertation, we had a number of ongoing weather station observations. We had uh, three different weather stations. Each of those weather stations had duff probes put into the upper middle duff, upper duff, middle duff, lower duff, in bare mineral soil. And we tracked uh, volumetric moisture content across the site. And we also looked at uh, rainfall within those, and we created a threshold that Morgan presented earlier of safe burning conditions. This is a management threshold. So we, we had all these experimental burns, and we took all the ones that had zero mortality, and we said, that's good. And we looked at these weather stations, and we said, this is the threshold of duff volumetric moisture content, content, uh, content. And because it was measured 
you know, with a particular probe, we just call it an index, but essentially it's volumetric moisture content, so 86%. If we're above that, we burn. Safe. And I'll have to think about that more and whether that actually, you know, transfers to gravimetric. But mm -hmm. the, um, here's the threshold that we practically derive. And here is the, the actual measured <coughs> duff moisture throughout the year. And in the gray bars, the rainfalls, the rainfall amounts that produced it. The thing that I want you to take home from this graphic is how many days are above the safe threshold? You ain't got a lot of opportunities to burn data. And this is one year, and it changes from year to year, and it changes seasonally. Look at the safe thresholds in, uh, in 2001. They occurred with, uh, with late August rains. Who wants to burn duff in August? I mean, I, I never would have thought this going in. But this past summer, we were burning over the top of duff at Avon Air Force Base again because it was one of the wettest summers they had on record. We were doing it with the helicopter, and it looked great. You know, so seasonality, it doesn't really have anything to do with it, although when you're in the growing season, you got all those roots, duff dries out really fast, and some of these graphics will show that too. But the, uh, the opportunity to burn, especially downstate, is almost all going to be in the summer, right? You know, when we burned that, uh, that stand at Eglin in the summer in 1999 and killed a bunch of timber, you know, that was just a mistake. We had plenty of winter opportunities up there when we get winter rainfall. But in the, uh, in the central part of the state where you're more subtropical and you get this wet, dry season, you, know, you really need to, to calibrate this to your site. And it really is helpful to think about where that, that, that custom <coughs> duck, safe duck burning threshold is and then monitor the number of days and when they occur at your site. Morgan alluded to this earlier, and Greg has talked extensively about this. What's the duff moisture map, the threshold or duff moisture that matters in order to, uh, to, to monitor and make a go-no-go -no -go decision on your prescribed fire? The fermentation layer here is tracking duff moisture you know, way down here. The, uh, the humus layer is actually drier than the fermentation layer in most of this graphic. And then you got the, so the surface mineral soil is much higher. And so duff is drier than, than mineral soil, but if you're taking your, so your duff moisture reading here and thinking that you're safe, well, your, your humus layer is not safe. And so where you take matters. And so you need to, to dig in, and, and do you have two inches of mostly fermentation layer that you're trying to consume, or do you have a really well-developed overrising that's got that, that, that you know, four or five inches of humus? And, uh, and then track those independently because when the roots are drawing water, if they have proliferated here in the, uh, the humus layer, it's going to be drier. There's no doubt about it. When, when, the, when the trees are transpiring, they're going to draw down your water. Um, and, and this is not always the, the, the same in, you know, in the graphic, right? I mean, so it changes seasonally and it changes based on how your trees have colonized your duff. But the point is that these layers can and, and are very different in the amount of moisture content. And, and they vary significantly with respect to the presence of a safe duck burning threshold. Does that make sense? We had this really fancy system at Eglin. Uh, so after that grant, um, Morgan, the $300,000, we finally did kill trees, so we were successful there. And then we, we had an automated weather station that had those probes in it that we left in in perpetuity. For about 10 years, we tracked every day we knew whether we were above or below those, that threshold. We had the probes in there. And I, uh, I had the privilege of restoring about 3,000 acres around Morgan's dissertation sites at Raymer Tower today. 285, Highway 285, about two miles of road frontage. It was nasty sand pine and crows, hardwood and crows, long wave pine. And you know, when we started burning for, for the duff reduction experiment, I was like, man, you know, I bet you we could harvest the sand pine and I could, I could burn the whole stand. So I had 2,000 acres of duff that I had started to slowly meter out. And I remember one day I hit it with a helicopter. It was perfect duff prescription day. The burn went off without a hitch, and I'm, I'm like hurt my arm, pat myself on the back, and I get a call from James Fern. He goes, Kevin, uh, you need to come down to South Bend, Range Road 416. And I burned up the weather station. <laughs> <laughs> the only place we hadn't been burning duff is we scratched around the weather station every year. This is like the third fire, right? I have a spot, go into the weather station and smolder out all the duff, <coughs> including all of our duff probes. And so that was thus ended the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, you know, this kind of this kind of system is actually easily accomplished on any laws, and, and it could be something that we that we push for statewide. Um, there's been some interest in developing a dust moisture monitoring system where you have instead of a 10-hour fuel stick, you might have vermiculite dust probe in that, give you an index that's consistent across um, across a you know a, a network like the states or, or federal laws. But these are the kinds of tools that, that we were using to, to help manage our, our uh, burn prescriptions. Um, duff saturation. Talked a little bit about KBI, and now I want to talk a little bit about rainfall. This is a complicated curve, which is, is almost like overly complicated. But we, we wanted to ask the question, how much rain does it take to resaturate duff? And so we measured all of the, the rain events from duff when it's wet all the way to, the, to when it's dry. And essentially what this curve shows is that when you're really wet, it doesn't take that much to re-wet you, right? I mean, that makes sense. When you're really dry, everything, it takes as much as four, three to four inches of rain within a 48-hour uh, a period immediately preceding. But you get four inches of rain within the previous 48 hours, and you got, say, bur duck burning uh, conditions, at least at Eglin Air Force Base. That was, uh, that was the purpose of this. And we can create these, again, if we're monitoring duffs, uh, duff moisture uh, with a weather station. We can create these kinds of saturation curves at a particular site for managers. We just need to we need to get another grant for it so that we mm -hmm. have a little travel and weather station. But these are the kinds of curves that you need to have in your hip pocket if you're going to develop a, a good duff moisture uh, prescription. At, you know, from your particular site. But if you want to borrow one, our <coughs> our take home when we were in normal burning conditions had to have an integrator uh, of rain in the previous 48 hours in order to burn the duff site. And when we were really dry, we just didn't, we just didn't burn duff. And so when we're up here in this, you know, in, in that part of the, uh, the, the saturation curve, we didn't, we didn't burn. We didn't want to rely on that four inches of rain uh, coming out of a drought condition, but we could have. We knew what was safe. So if anybody's a Robert Penn Warren fan, it's a wonderful quote. <laughs> My dad was a professor of Southern Lit, so I had to read you know, Faulkner and all, all, all the Southern writers. So uh, the, uh, the truth is that we're, we're playing a long game here. And, uh, and you can make that game short, but you make it messy if, uh, if you try to rush to restore. We used to talk about the rule of thumb, you know, it took 50 years to get here, it's going to take you 50 years to get back. And, and the, it, it just ain't right, right? One of the neat things about our experiences at Eglin uh, and Ordway and at Moody Forest and others is that it actually goes away pretty fast. It didn't take 50 years. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the idea that you've got to be patient and you're going to take a long time is true, but you're going to get there in your careers. And one of the, the, neat, the, the, the joys of my return to Eglin is i got to drive 285, and I look at that stand, and yeah, I, I'm more the loss of my window station. I don't, I don't I'm going to lie. But I look at that stand, and it's got no duff. It has saturated and red-calcated woodpeckers, and we got old trees, with the exception of Morgan's dry and, 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 <laughs> and mostly dry uh, treatment blocks. And so it's possible to restore this, and it's possible to do it in 15 to 20 years. And so, uh, so that, is, that is really encouraging. But if you screw up, it's possible to look at that screw up for, for 100 years. So patience and perspective. You know, this is this is not rocket science. I'm not a rocket scientist, but the idea that we need to rush to restore is something that every single one of us, it, it, you know, as managers, we get somebody, whether it's a line officer in the federal uh, the government or whether it's a state, uh, you know, recreation uh, objective. We get the pressure to make it fast, make it now. Well, I want RCWs, red cock kid woodpeckers in my stand tomorrow, and I want you know old growth. Yesterday, well, it takes a long time to grow an old tree, as, as Leon Neal used to say, 100 years to grow a 100-year-old tree. And if, if you get in a rush, you will eliminate those from your stand. If you get in a rush, you will create a problem for you. You may create liability for your organization. But if you don't rush, these things are achievable. And I think that I'm, I'm really a big fan of fire regime objectives. I mean, we too often focus on an individual fire, and you've got to get that one right when you're burning duff, but you've got to think about what are my fire regime objectives. If I'm burning over duff, I don't have to burn every two years. 
But I think if you're able to stick fire in a site you know, three or four times in a 10 to 12 year period of time, you're on the right trajectory and you're going to be out of the woods with respect to the massive amounts of mortality that you could expect. And so thinking fire regimes and committing to this, this 12 to, to 20 year um, you know, strategy is, is really important. Don't, don't make the mistake. You know, you're, you're, you're in, you got a good fire in, you're ready for that second fire, maybe third fire. Just don't take a chance of the mishap. I, I, I always get the question, of when can I start, you know, putting that growing season fire in? Like, manage the fuels first, then manage the structure later, right? If you manage the fuels first, you know, you, you won't create a mishap. And, and if you want growing season fire, sometimes you just watch those objectives. Again, this summer was a great time to get both growing season fire and duff management. Um, and, and so just monitor those, uh, those, those uh, objectives and those prescription parameters. Um, we didn't talk a little bit of, or much about this, Morgan, but decomposition appears to be the biggest driver. When we say you want fire to gradually reduce, uh, reduce duff, what we're really saying is we want just a surface fire. Burn off the litter. And in between those fires, that, that litter consumption releases phosphorus, you get increased microbial activity due to insolation or solar heating on the, the soil surface. And we've, we've documented <coughs> significant reductions in between fires. We weren't doing nothing. We just removed the litter later. You come back two or three years later, and it's down another two inches. And, and so decomposition is your friend. And so concentrate on the litter, the surface fire and the surface litter. And don't worry about, did I take two inches off the duff with this fire? The two inches are going to come in between your fires. You, is that uh, it, that's something that I, that I really believe strongly, and, and yet we don't have a. Well, we tried. We submitted the bank proposal to get funded. I know. I know. That, that, <laughs> to, to do that, and I, and I think it's the the CN sites. Some sites make it back so fast, mm -hmm. and how much duff, how much you know duff consumption took place that didn't happen in the fires is just it's amazing at some sites. All right, so very quickly, I'm going to wrap up in about three or four minutes, but you know, monitor your progress. Morgan's got this really <coughs> low-tech uh, duff pen methodology to be able to, to see how fast it's disappearing. And um, if you want to look at, at landscape scale changes, this is Eglin from 2002 to 2012. In 10 years, we had, on average, this is not at the base of the trees. This is, this is duff taken within plots, 200 uh, plots across the, the range. On average, we had about a half an inch of duff across the entire site. That means some had none, some had boatload. But we had two tenths of an inch of duff across the entire site 10 years later. And so that's a lot of recovery. And if you really want to put it in a site-specific context, this is one of Morgan's uh, uh, flatwoods, <coughs> uh, old growth duff re reintroduction sites called White Point. That old growth, beautiful. Um, it had not. It had one fire in the previous 40 or 50 years prior to this experiment, but we were averaging around the base of these trees about three to four inches of, uh, of duff, two and a half to four inches of duff. Um, you know, we've slowly seen a reduction of this over time to, to just about a, a, an inch. Once you're down to that inch, we're safe. You know, and, and we burn that site whenever we can now. And it took about three fires. So in, in about 10 years, we. We got out of the woods with respect to duff problems at White Point, and that's that's a, again another very encouraging thing for managers. And um, actually, that was four fires in ten years, but it, but we were very conservative for the first three, and uh, and after that, it's it's gorgeous. Biodiversity is returning. Um, you know, it's a it's an amazing site. Um, there are some tools that you can use as managers, especially during mop-up. So the mop-up phase of, of duck management is so critical. This is a FLIR 1. It's about a $200 plug-in to your iPhone or Android. And, uh, and you can see hot spots that are not smoking with the FLIR 1. We tested this at the, uh, the Oki Finoki uh, West Mims fire this year. Um, uh, Ren's got some great pictures if you want to see um, on his, his computer. But this is a great little tool for doing mop-up and, uh, and monitoring at, as you're burning over the top of Duff units. And, and wouldn't it have been nice to have at the Flemington in sight, you know, those first few bar burns as you're looking. So let's end with just a few recommendations uh, that, that summarize what we've talked about or what I've talked to you about. Um, restore fuels before forest structure. Take a fuels approach to restoration. Burn on the margins of combustion for those reintroduction fires. 
Sometimes uh, that night prescription, old Scott Sosha at Moody Forest, he had a prescription that was like burning into the evening. And he could do it because of the, 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 the particulars uh, of his site, no down drainage issues. And it was gorgeous, unbelievable fire effects uh, with respect to dump. Dedicate mop up resources for two to three days. What Morgan described up at Flomanton, what we've experienced in Brooklyn, you think you nailed it, and then you're out there mopping up the next night. Um, and if, because there is a duff threshold for mortality, if you can get on the mop up fast and keep that, keep that duff donut to 30% or less, you're going to save those trees. There was no mortality below 30%. It was a threshold function. If you wait on the mop up and you come back three days later and you got half that duff around the base of the tree gone, the tree is probably going to be a goner. And so, you know, jump on the mop up fast and focus on those vector fuels. We'll talk a lot about that in the field. Um, you've got to prioritize duff. If you've got a, a boatload of or acres to burn, but you want to hit these narrow prescription windows, you got to just go when the day is right. Whether it's summer, whether it's winter, you got to go. Use conservation prescriptions, um, the conservative prescriptions for up to three burns. That's my recommendation. Um, monitor reduction with duff pens so that you know when, when, the, when you don't have to take as much care. And you know, split those units by objective. Separate out those levels where you want to consume duff from the uplands if you can uh, as you're planting burns. And Greg, I just want to leave, uh, give you the opportunity to discuss this sheet here as we'll pass these out. But customize your site. I mean, what, what works for Eglin may or may not work for you. And so, yeah, you can help me pass these out. Greg and uh, St. Mark's have got a prescription sheet that, uh, that represents their rules of thumb that work for them. And it's, uh, it's remarkably good for, uh, you know, that matches the science that Morgan has. But Greg, you want to talk just briefly about that? Yeah, this. this these guidelines for duff moisture were developed by Doug Scott, who was a wildland fire operations specialist at St. Mark's, um, over a period of about 20 years, and it's mostly just his, his observational data. And he actually would go out and take duff moisture samples in the Flatwoods units that we were burning, and um, he would dry them. We have a moisture oven that we dry with the balance in it and all. And, um, this is the guideline that he came up with, and it, it worked remarkably well for us. And we use it as a guideline when we're burning. But the key is where are you taking those dust samples? Because you can go out in a flatwoods unit that has two foot of elevation difference, and depending where you take, if you take just one sample, I can make it almost come out to whatever dust moisture I want. So you can fool yourself by taking the sample in the wrong spot or so you need multiple samples and you got to be really careful with where you take your sample. If you're taking it in the dry site on the flatwoods but you're concentrating, we're doing a lot of burning for flatwood salamander and we're trying to get into those pond margins. So that's, you know, that's where we're really concentrating on our duff moisture samples. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's, it really is the application of the concept that I was, I was trying to get across. And when you brought that today, that, that just is a perfect compliment. I appreciate you sharing that. So that's, we've already talked about the conclusions. And so if there are any burning questions or just snapping scares, we'd be, uh, be happy to deal with you. Great. Thank you all. moisture probes that you had to measure your duck moisture? They were were they on your raw station? They were, they were 0615 probes. And they're available for raw stations and you can pull it all up? Yep. Okay. Can you go back to that one slide, the uh, recommendations? Oh, I thought you were going to tell me one was garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I can't write this fast. I think David's going to make available any any of this stuff. You, you guys want that? Um, I know it depends on situation, but um, at the very beginning, you were stressing the point of knowing your fire regime or chronological the fire. Is there a way that you can measure down buildup and sort of figure out when the last time that was burned? You know, I think the roots are key, right? It seems roots come in somewhere between you know fifteen and. Four years, and, and, and I, I, this is something that we really ought to, yep. ought to nail down. Yep. So few folks right now are interested in watching their sites degrade, so, so it makes it difficult to, to document. Hey, 
in this, this long, but I think we do have a, a good sense of whether or not a site is going past a threshold, uh, you know, once you have that, that final colonization. And, um, you know, to me, that, that really is, is the key for me when I'm, I'm starting to ratchet down on a very conservative prescription. If it's just been 10 or 15 years since fire, I mean, I, I, may, I may let it rip. Even think, though that's going to have a little bit of death layer. I think your, your points that you kind of started to hit on uh, about decomposition are a pretty interesting kind of side tool that you can start to learn more about. And I just going to, I think we'd like to talk about that a little bit more this afternoon in the field. Okay. Because I think there's some questions about that with some of the management actions that they've taken across the street. So I just want to put that in your head to, to sort of like yeah, I know I'm eating in a time, so let me, let me get off the stage here. I'm